I'm Rich Kerr. Thank you again. I'm here for, to talk to you tonight about the railways in Haverford Township. Uh, this is going to be a lot of slides, so I may go through them fairly quickly uh, for you. Uh, that's why I'm glad we have the YouTube uh, backup for this. It'll be recorded and posted on YouTube. So if you want to go through a little slower and check all the details and dates in the slides and try to get a handle on it, you'll be able to do that. So I'm going to uh, try to pull up my presentation now. Mary, I'm getting something strange. Mary, do you need to re-give me yeah, rights? I, no, I did give you rights. Um, I just I had we got cut moving. off. No, I was wondering if we need to redo it. Let's try it one more time. Let's let me. Oh, you know what? We did that. We did. So let's hold on. Let's let's try to make you co-host. I'd forgotten you'd gone out and came back in. Now you should be able to do it. Okay. Thank you. There we are. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. Um, my talk tonight is on the, all the railways in Haverford Township. Um, there are quite a lot of them in history. We had seven different railways in a township that's only 10 square miles across. We have a uh, remarkable variety and density when you consider how small the township is and an amazing variety of uh, types of railways. I'm using the term railways because they weren't all railroads. There's a difference if you're a, somebody who understands railroading. Uh, the first one was a primitive early railroad with actually pulled by horses. Uh, second is a mainline steam line, later a pioneering electrification, the Paoli uh, line we know today. The third was a sleepy rundown railroad branch line, the Newtown Square branch. Four and five were suburban trolley lines. Six was a high speed interurban railway. And seven is a train railway that was never actually built, but had a surprising impact on the development of our township anyway. Between them all, starting in 1832, we've been going for 190 years with railways in Haverford Township at this point. Okay, what was Haverford Township like before railways? Three words, rural, agricultural, and static. It just did not change. It was a bunch of small farms and it was that way for many, many, many decades. I'm using this map from 1887 from an atlas by Smith to show Haverford Township in summary form. And throughout the speech, you'll see I draw lines on this to represent uh, each new railway as it comes in and each period of years that uh, that represents this map will represent the situation. But the uh, Haverford was basically just the uh, farm parcels at that point. The first railroad in Haverford Township was the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad. It was built by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It was part of the main line of public works between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Uh, the state legislature wanted to have something they felt Pennsylvania was falling behind the Erie Canal in New York and the uh, Cumberland uh, Canal in Maryland. And they wanted to be economically competitive, uh, getting goods to and from the West. So they uh, signed themselves up to uh, put together a thing called the main line of public works. It couldn't all be a canal because between here and the uh, Susquehanna River, the surveyors determined there weren't enough waterways to have enough water to support the canal. So instead they adopted uh, pretty bravely the early primitive railway technology that was just emerging at that time. And then they went to Susquehanna uh, River 
uh, used boats up the river, canals on the other side, inclines and all kinds of crazy uh, portage railroads to uh, get up and over the mountains and to the other end of Pittsburgh. It was a complicated ordeal with uh, putting boats on dollies and hauling them up railways on mountains, uh, transloading gear from rail cars to canal boats and back. Uh, very, very complicated, but they wanted to compete. The uh, Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad was the portion between the Schuylkill and Susquehanna rivers. Uh, George Harding has called this the beginning of the Paoli local in his book, Mainline uh, by Rail. In 1832, the first 20 miles were opened, including the stretch in Haverford Township. And by 1834, the entire railroad was completed to the Susquehanna, to Columbia, uh, two tracks and 82 miles long. So the red line that you see drawn through the upper right of the map here shows that line. And it dips across through the northeast corner of Haverford Township and heads back up. And uh, if I can put this in context for you. That's Railroad Avenue today. And then as it gets to the top of Haverford Township, it crosses over the main intersection where the Wawa and the Bryn Mawr Hospital is and goes down what's now a side street. Um, I'm trying to remember the name, Glen something road, Glenbrook road, and comes out again on a, a county line road by the 7-Eleven and then ran through where houses are and went across to where Galifty's is. That went down the side road by Galifty's and it joined what's now the present railroad by Rosemont Station. The problem in 1832 was no one knew how to run a railroad. They didn't know what it took. They used the closest model they had, which was a toll road or turnpike. So basically operators paid a toll to use the line. They had to provide their own carriages or wagons with the horse or mule team and the drivers. Uh, no one actually controlled the traffic. They all just got on the track. They had to have a carriage or wagon that could uh, stay on the rails. And uh, it was chaos. One of the funny stories is they had mile posts. And the rule was whoever, if they were coming in two directions toward each other, whoever got to the mile post first had to, could stay on the track and the other one had to get off. So people would race as fast as they could towards each other <laughs> just when they saw a mile post ahead and another carriage coming the other way, which of course uh, wasn't very safe. So it was crazy. It was uh, run by politicians in Harrisburg and you can guess the outcome. Um, these are some pictures that show some of the technology the picture on the right, we believe, is from Haverford Township. It was taken by Wilbur Hall. They didn't have railroad ties yet. They didn't really have steel rails yet. So they cut stone blocks, quarried out stone blocks, and drilled two holes in each one. And they would fasten wooden sleepers along these two rows of blocks and then put iron strap on top or an angle iron or something like that for the wheels to wear and run on. Um, this one on the right is interesting because it does shows a full length sleeper going all the way across to keep the two rails uh, a set distance apart. The other one is from part of the Portage Railroad farther west where they would put a canal, a boat on a frame and like a flat car and pull it out of the water and drag it up the hill on these rails and go down the other side and put it back in the water. Okay, finally, things settled into standard railroad practices as we know them today. The state decided some, they had to do something. Steam locomotives were becoming available. They were very early and crude, but they bought some of the earliest steam locomotives. The, uh, they themselves would then haul the uh, uh, fare payers, the uh, toll payers train of carriages. They took all the carriages together and uh, pull them and so you started to get set time, set operations, and a little more control over the operations. You still could bring or you could rent uh, your own wagon. Uh, they still do allow privately owned rail cars on the rail system today all over the country. Later on, iron and steel T-shaped rail was developed. They call it T-rail because the cross section looks like an upside down letter T with a wide base and a kind of a knobby top uh, for the wheels to wear on. 
So the technology gradually evolved, operations simplified, and things got better. Here's one of the earliest uh, locomotives that they had. This is the Washington from 1836. You can see how crude it is. It's a wooden smoke box. It's got a vertical boiler on the back. There is absolutely no environmental protection for the engineer who could literally fall off the back of the engine. Uh, and it would chug along, uh, dragging no wagons behind it. This is actually one of the first known photographs. It's from 1848, and it shows the Philadelphia and Columbia Railroad locomotive, the Tioga, built by Norris Brothers. So that's a very interesting thing. At this point, you can see it still has a vertical boiler in the back. The steam is coming out of it. It has a tender behind that. The tender, the uh, walls on the back and the sides are actually a tank to hold water. And then this empty spot in the middle, they would pile up firewood and eventually coal uh, to fuel the engine. A steam engine basically uh, burns something like water coal, creates steam, steam turns the, the piston on the front right under the smokestack, that angle thing back and forth, and that cranks the wheels around to make motion. It's basically a big tea kettle uh, with a piston attached that cranks the wheels. Finally, in uh, 1857, the Pennsylvania Railroad offered and the state accepted their offer to buy this line from the state. And the state wanted by that time to be out of the railroad and the uh, main line of public works business. The Pennsylvania Railroad was formed in 1846. In 1852, they built a line from Harrisburg to Pittsburgh through the uh, mountainous part of the state. You'll notice Pittsburgh has no H at the end of it. That didn't happen until the 1910s. In 1857, they bought the main line of public works. They then completed an all rail route across Pennsylvania, and they continued to constantly improve the line and the operations and make improvements. By 1855, Haverford College had a flag stop on the line and a rudimentary shelter was there. Here's a map that shows from that time, the Haverford station abbreviated uh, on the line at Hafford College. The one above that's the Whitehall Hotel. And then they go on and on. Uh, it doesn't really, north is not north on, or up on this map, but they headed out west uh, to the Susquehanna River in Columbia. Over time, the Pennsylvania Railroad improved and straightened the line, especially in this area. They didn't waste time. They bought entire parcels. They bought entire farms uh, rather than just a corridor. And then they sold off the excess land and made money doing development by doing that. Uh, so between 1869 and 1871, they built a new alignment and stages through here. They replaced the so-called Whitehall Curve that came through Haverford Township and passed the Whitehall Hotel, which was sort of across from the Wawa today. Um, they built the new Haverford College, Bryn Mawr and Rosemont stations. And at that point, this line only touched on the very northeast corner of the township. We no longer had a station within the township. Uh, this old line was used until the new line was fully, fully in use and then continued afterwards for certain purposes, but eventually was redundant and was taken down. So this map, which is good from 1871 to 1894, shows in orange the new railroad line you can see it just touches the corner of the township. And the red line, the former line that's been straightened out is now shown as a dotted line. It's no longer there. And instead we had Railroad Avenue. This is a photograph that shows the uh, Meeting House Walk footbridge over Railroad Avenue after it was no longer a rail line. One of those little stone support walls is still there along Railroad Avenue. If you look today as you go by, uh, under the newer footbridge. The Pennsylvania Railroad main line matured. It grew to a four track Broadway to the West. That was their advertising slogan. It had nothing to do with Broadway in New York, but it was the Broadway to the West because it was four tracks wide through here. They eliminated all the grade crossings in our area. They had intense freight and passenger service. The passenger service was both long haul and local. In 1915, this line to Paoli was the first major electrification by the Pennsylvania Railroad. It had been steam until that point. In 1968, the line went to Penn Central 
and in 1976, it went to Amtrak and it become the Harrisburg line. Here we see a timetable on the left with the slogan, the broad way to the west. And up above is Hatford Station, which is actually in Lower Marion Township. Uh, but you can see the, uh, the kind of trains that once ran, the old red cars that would uh, grind and uh, growl and they left the station and squeal when they came in to put the brakes on. This is the uh, other side of Haverford Station with the train going to head away from us uh, towards Paoli. We get to the next period, it may be hard to see in yellow at the bottom. That's the Newtown Square branch from 1894 to 1895. Uh, that's the yellow line and it goes up through the middle of the township and then leans over to the west and heads on out into Marple and then Radnor. The Newtown Square branch opened on July 3rd, 1894. There was a branch from the Octoraro branch of the Pennsylvania Railroad that left that line at Fernwood uh, in Lower, Delaware, uh, Lower uh, Upper Darby and went up on its way to Newtown Square, basically through open countryside. It was 10 miles long. It was a single track. It had sidings for freight customers. It had three stations with staff and seven flag stops. And it went on mile post 5.5 to 15.6 at the time they measured that from the old Broad Street station in Philadelphia. Here's the schedule from July 3rd, 1894. And you can see the trains both weekdays and Sundays. This is what we now call Lanark. Back then the stop was called Westchester Pike. And the foreground in the middle is the passenger station. Behind that is the freight station with the raised platform up at the height of box cars so that they could load and unload things easily. And then load them on the other end into, uh, on the other side into trucks and wagons. Uh, this is what we now call uh, Lanark Crossing, the famous place where the Battle of Lanark Crossing took place, the trolley line, the trolleys on the left, the line crossed the railroad here. We'll discuss that. And on the right are some cars set out on a siding, either for loading or unloading or later pick up by the railroad the next time the train comes through. There were three identical sets of pairs of stations like this at Westchester Turnpike, Lanark, Grassland, which later became known as Eagle Road or Oakmont area, and then at Newtown Square, just across Route 252, where the line ended. We had a third station, a flag stop in Haverford, that's Brookthorpe, and it likely had a shed like this, which was a standard Pennsylvania Railroad three-sided shed for uh, flag stops at um, little branch lines. That would have been right at the base of what is now Haverford Reserve, uh, Andy Lewis Community Park. The passenger train service only lasted 14 years, from 1894 to 1908. It started with five trains daily, went to seven the next year, and the next year after that was already being cut back to three, and eventually in 1908 was discontinued. These reasons are that there was very few people out here to carry, and there was competition from a trolley line, the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company. What you see on the left is an actual Newtown Square train at Newtown Square, and that's the whole train. There was a 440 steam engine, two small wheels, four small wheels in the front, four large driving wheels on the back, kind of a modernized version of what ran in the Civil War, if you think of the general. And it pulled one car. And part of that car was a baggage section. You can see the baggage door. And the remainder of the car was a passenger section with seats. And that's all it took to handle this line. Conversely, the freight service went for 87 years until 1981. By 1913, this was no longer called the uh, Philadelphia and the Delaware County Railroad, a separate corporation. The Pennsylvania Railroad was over 300 corporations and consolidated a lot of them, consolidated a lot of them in that year. And this just became known as the PRR Newtown Square Branch. 51 saw the last use of a steam locomotive. In 63, the last train ran beyond Oakmont. I have the dates here for when the tracks and bridges were removed. 68 was the Penn Central creation of the Pennsylvania and New York Central, a merger. In 1976, Conrail was created. These all ran on this line. And then in 1981, the last train ran on the branch and it was uh, formally abandoned in 1982. The picture shows a steam engine coming across 
Township Line Road from Lansdowne Avenue. It went diagonally across the intersection right there where a Township Line uh, crosses over Darby Road, Lansdowne Avenue. You can see the men on the left waving a grimy red flag. Imagine trying to stop Township Line traffic today just by walking out with the grimy red flag. And this is in grassland. Uh, this today would be the uh, YMCA parking lot. And you can see the train is pushing a caboose towards Eagle Road. Uh, they would run the caboose on one end of the train so they could use, set out and pick up cars at the other end of the train without having the caboose in the way. Why did they get rid of the line at Beyond Oakmont? And this is one of the two reasons. This is the trestle over Ellis Road. It was uh, extremely high, extremely long, and uh, getting old, and the crews are actually afraid to run their diesel locomotives across this trestle. And then there was a longer one across Marple Road, 457 feet, 48 feet high. And uh, the abutment at the far end and the pier in the middle of the picture are still there today if you go down Marple Road to where Parkview Drive and Darby Creek Road uh, join it. You can look over and see those abutments and the concrete work. This was a special rail fan excursion train in 1939, a chance for fans to ride a line that hadn't had passengers since 1908. Um, this is going across a bridge across Darby Creek. Uh, they're leaving Haverford and coming towards Marple Township when they cross the creek. Uh, the line where the passenger cars are is now a walking trail on the west end of Haverford Reserve, and you can go walk on it. There are still some railroad ties up there. Uh, but we're hoping someday that we can fix up the piers and abutments, which are still there, and put the uh, walking trail bridge across and go into Marple and go all the way to Sprawl Road. In 19, 1895, the next sta stage occurred, and now we're into trolleys. And the Westchester trolley was put in. That's the green line along Westchester Pike. And things stayed this way until 1902. The Westchester trolley actually started with the Westchester Road being converted to a turnpike. There was a Philadelphia and Westchester Turnpike Company that was granted authority to make it a turnpike. Um, and they ran a turnpike uh, with moderate success and constant problems. In the 1880s, by the way, the original paving of the turnpike was uh, wooden planks. They had two lanes of wooden planks all the way from uh, Philadelphia to uh, Newtown Square. And those planks didn't last long. In the 1880s, a man named John Scheimer saw an opportunity. He started buying up turnpike stock because he wanted to put a railway along the turnpike. And in 1895, with control of the company, uh, he opened a line using secondhand steam dummies. I'll explain what they are in the next slide. And a year later, he was able to do an entirely electric trolley operation. And in 1898, he got the line completed all the way to Westchester. This is a steam dummy. If you look on the right-hand side, you'll see a driving wheel down at the bottom. And above it, it's blank inside. There's an actual steam engine on the, in the front. You can see the smokestack in the roof. And you can also, you know, maybe I can wave my course. There's a smokestack, there's a vent of some kind. And there was an engineer in here that ran that little steam engine that turned that wheel. And in the back, the conductor under his little awning would let people on and off. And this thing would chug along. The idea behind a steam dummy was it looked like a horse car, except it didn't have a horse. So it wouldn't scare horses that would be uh, on the turnpike. This is one of the first four wheel electric trolleys. They're so short, they couldn't even spell out the company name. So it's all abbreviated and fairly bumping along on this from Philadelphia to Westchester it would be an amazing experience. The track wasn't that great. They eventually went to more substantial and smoother riding uh, electric trolleys with more capacity and more power. This is one of those. This is Lanark Crossing looking east towards Upper Darby in the early 1900s. Um, you can see the one car railroad train crossing over on its way to the station and on to Newtown Square. There's a trolley waiting on the ready track. And uh, that's the way Westchester Pike looked back then. This is looking at the same intersection 
along the railroad line. The station is to the left. The water tank was not for the railroad. The water tank was for the trolleys. The uh, trolley company was required by its uh, permission to run on the road to water it down because it was just gravel and dirt. They had a sprinkler car, a big tank on wheels, and they would run the sprinkler car and extend pipes with small holes out and uh, water down the road every so often to keep dust down. This shows you the nature of Westchester Pike and the trolley line to Westchester in the early years. This is at a toll house. They purposely squeezed the road down so you, the toll taker could put his uh, beam across the line to block it and could get you as you went by to collect your toll. This is an early station or the type that was used along the Westchester line. This one's at Eagle Road. Across the road to the right would be the field where Manoa Shopping Center is today. And what do you see in the background? Farms, no housing, just farms. The uh, railroad and the railways and the trolleys all preceded development. These are a list of known stations on the Westchester line in 1939. And some of them say later because they came later than 1939. Some of them were renamed. And there's a note that the Westgate Hills station was uh, relocated a little farther west in 1954. But you see the names, you'll recognize many of them, some of them you won't. And here's a picture from later that shows it all. You have the steam engine on the left, you have the trolley on the right, and then you have the modern automobile with a smooth, permanent concrete road uh, heading out to Westchester. This is the history of transportation in our area, basically in a nutshell. This is the last trolley on a dismal day in 1958 at Westgate Hills. Uh, it is stopped here and then it will return to uh, 69th Street. This was the uh, end of where Westchester Pike was widened out to be a divided highway at that point in time. In 1902, the next change, the Ardmore trolley line was put in. That's the light blue line. It takes off from Westchester Pike at Lanark. That created something called Ardmore Junction. So the trolley line split at Ardmore Junction and the trolley line and the rail line crossed each other at Ardmore, or, or Lanark Crossing, I'm sorry, Lanark Junction, Lanark crossing. And then the trolley line went up along the side of what's now Darby Road to what's now Oakmont and then went across country and uh, approached the Pennsylvania Railroad at Lancaster Avenue and the Ardmore train station. Here's a, a temporary uh, certificate receipt form for the Ardmore and Lanark Street Railway Company. They set up a separate company legally to do the building of the line and then it was not only uh, turned over to the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company, but the trolleys that the Ardmore and Lanark Street Railway Company bought came lettered for the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company. So this is a 1901 incorporation. As I said, the Ardmore line branched off at Lanark Junction. It ended within walking distance of the Ardmore station on the main line. Service started on May 30th, 1902, Memorial Day weekend. And then later substantial stone trolley stations were then built along this line. And we'll explain why in a minute. This is the ceremonial first Ardmore line trolley taking off from Lanark Junction. Uh, on the bottom of the picture, you can see a straight line going down. That's the line to Westchester. And this is where the lines branched apart. And you see a for sale sign for lots in Lanark and several homes built. They look like they've been uh, kind of uh, added to the picture uh, by uh, darkroom deviousness, but actually they're really there. I looked very carefully and those are actual photos of actual homes on site. So that's what Lanark looked like in 1902. This is a combination toll house and waiting room. Uh, and this is a later view showing a couple uh, all dressed up waiting to get into town and the trolley is coming along. And this is a view up the line towards Cardmore. There's a road barely visible on the left, right here. That is present day Darby Road. It's had a number of names over the years. 
and the odd structure in front is their cattle guard. Cattle would not want to walk across all those spaced bars along the bottom. And the angled things let them take a fence right up to it without having the fence get too close to the side of the trolley. So there actually was a problem with keeping cows and cattle off the tracks back then. And this is what the, the, the trolley line and railroads did to prevent that. And again, you mostly see uh, undeveloped farmland as you look up the hill towards uh, through Lanark. This is Oakmont. Uh, you can't see on the left, on the other side of the track, the Oakmont school, it hadn't been built yet. And the big house, you can't see, that's the Wawa now on the right. So this is the shopping district of Oakmont that we're standing in, believe it or not. You can see uh, in front of the house is one of the substantial stone stations that the railway had. Uh, they also had oval grade crossing signs and that's what you see next to the station. But this is how uh, undeveloped this area was back when they built this in 1902. Um, the company continued to upgrade. A new man came along and got control. He was a lawyer that had been assigned to, uh, as, a, as an advisor to the line. He saw potential in it and saw what was coming. And he uh, bought enough stock so that he could take control of the company from John Scheimer. And what he saw ahead was a number of things happening all at once. First of all, there was going to be a elevated subway elevated line built along Market Street in Philadelphia. It would no longer be necessary to get on a small trolley and go 60 some blocks through every corner in Philadelphia. And uh, all the uh, crazy, uh, even though it might be sparse, uh, uh, uncontrolled, unregulated, mostly horse pulled traffic in the street of, of Market Street. Secondly, that line was going to have a terminal at 69th Street. Uh, he made arrangements to build a terminal right next to it, combined with it for the trolley systems. And third, another railway, which we'll talk about next, the Philadelphia and Western Railway was being built. It would open in 1907 and also have a terminal tied into the other two. So suddenly there was going to be a, a lot of high-speed, high-powered rail lines um, all feeding a very quick transport into Philadelphia. It only stopped every four to six blocks and was above all the traffic and later in the tunnel below all the traffic. And he knew that this would uh, make a lot of business and uh, cause a lot of development and suburbanization of our area. All of that happened in 1907. What also happened at the same time wasn't transportation, it was communications. Uh, the US Post Office had started to implement something called rural free delivery of the mail. Before then, you had to go to the post office if you didn't live in the city and say, hi, any mail for me? And they'd tell you whether you had or not, or they'd tell you know, Mrs. McDonald next door, tell them to come by, there's a piece of mail here waiting for them. Uh, now you could get delivery at home. And in fact, back then they got delivery twice a day. And the other thing that happened was telephone service was spreading rapidly and becoming technologically better and more affordable. So suddenly it was possible for more and more people to have a house out in the clean air of the country the city was all full of houses that were uh, heated by coal. The streets were all full of horse manure and stagnant puddles. Uh, there were constant epidemics of this and that in the city, uh, smoky air, soot and smog. And people could have a dream of buying a house out in the suburbs, uh, which offered them a yard, uh, clean air and better living. They could work as the uh, new office and retail uh, uh, economic force in the city and still stay in touch with the home uh, while doing that. So Merrick Taylor, the man who took over the operation, uh, got busy building up the line ahead of 1907. This is the Brookline station. You can see freshly poured concrete platforms. You can see a two car train. The other things these large interurban cars could do, they could couple them together and control the propulsion systems on all the cars from one position up at the front of the train. So he could run multi-car trains and uh, had two tracks, one in and one out, and could really uh, start to haul the crowds. These are the stops in 1939 on the Ardmore line. 
grassland became was called Oakmont by that time. And the, uh, most of the other names you'll recognize. This is, uh, compare this to the picture of all the farms in the background with no housing. This is in the 20s, late 20s probably. This is the uh, South Ardmore stop at Darby Road and Benedict Avenue. You're basically looking north from where the middle school is now up towards Oakmont and you see the commercial district and you see the cars and the parking and the roads on both sides of the streets that are now paved. This just happened in a few decades uh, because of the possibilities for people to, more people to live out here uh, in the suburbs. This is an excursion for rail fans in 1949. So there are people climbing all over the place to take pictures and get a good look. They're up at the uh, P&W platform overhead to get uh, interesting views of the roofs of the trolleys. The woman in the right seems to be shielding her child from all these crazy men. And you see two styles of cars, the older interurban on the left and a modern lightweight car from the 1930s on the right. This is at Ardmore Junction. This is a snow sweeping trolley. That's how they uh, cleared the tracks. Uh, if it got really bad, they had a plow. And if it got worse than that, they had a rotary, uh, uh, a rotary uh, a plow that looked like a, a big bunch of blades on the front of the car that would actually throw the uh, snow many, many feet away. Um, this is the county line station in the 1960s. This is where the trolley behind this one is where you left Haverford Township and went into Lower Marion and the Ardmore section there. But that broom on the front was angled and it was powered by an electric motor and it would sweep the snow forward, tossing it off the tracks. And you can see the job it's done, uh, creating the trench in the snow along the track. This is the, during the final days of operation of the Ardmore line in December, 1966. This is Murwood Station with one of the uh, pretty substantial stone stations. They were all built to this design. Uh, some are still standing along the uh, Drex, oh, I'm sorry, the Sharon Hill and media lines that are still around today. This shows the widening of Westchester Pike in 1953. The car is passing Trinity Lutheran Church. The uh, Westchester Pike is the two lane road on the other side of the tracks. And the big trench on the right hand side of the tracks will be another two lanes that are being added south of the trolley and south of the old Westchester Pike so that it will end up being a four lane divided highway with two trolley tracks in the median. If you're from my generation, uh, that's what you remember. This is a general view just showing stored cars in the yard in Lanark in 1954. That's the rotary plow I was talking about in the middle. And you can see the blades that would toss the snow out of that chute at the top and they could have it shoot to the left or shoot to the right. They couldn't do it when they were near any houses because it would uh, toss it right through the windows. This is the 1930s lightweight car uh, shown in the 1950s in front of the Lanark car barn. This is now Coles. This was all demolished and is now Coles. Before that, I think it was Clover, wasn't it? And this is inside the car barn. This is after SEPTA took over, this is in 1970. But you'll notice to take this picture, somebody snuck in and set the destination side to read Ardmore Express to Oakmont. This is a 1941 lightweight car. The last set of cars built by the JG Brill Company in Philadelphia, which was the largest builder of street cars in America and maybe the world. Okay, that's the Red Arrow trolley lines. Now we come to the P&W Railway. As I said, it was built in 1907. It went along the Cobbs Creek Valley in Haverford Township and then swung to the west in Radnor and uh, went out to Stratford. And it ran in this form until 1954. So this is what the map looks like uh, from, from 1907 to 1954. And you can see six different railways, the former red one, the uh, relined orange one, Pennsylvania Railroad, the uh, yellow Newtown Square branch, and the two trolley lines, green and blue. The Philadelphia and Western was originally part of a Gould family secret plan to uh, build a backdoor Pennsylvania Railroad competitor across the country. And the uh, 
it wasn't all that well thought out apparently. And I think the Pennsylvania got wind of it. They had actually started some of the tunnels in Western Pennsylvania. And one of those today, or re till recently, I'm sorry, was used for the Pennsylvania Turnpike decades later. In 1907, the line opened from 69th Street to Stratford. This was a high speed interurban. It was used an outside third rail instead of an overhead trolley wire. It had no grade crossings. It had super elevated or banked curves, high platform stations for faster boarding and safety. And the cars would skip many of the stations unless the, somebody waiting at the station pulled a, a rope to light a light down the track ahead of the station, or unless somebody on the car pushed the buzzer that they wanted to get off at the next station. And many people who didn't know that would be waiting patiently at a station for the first time, a visitor, and the car would blow right by them because they didn't know they had to pull the rope and light a light for the car to stop. In 1912, a branch line was built to Norristown, and that is today's Norristown High Speed Line for SEPTA. This is a great sign. This is a porcelain sign. It's probably two and a half by three feet. Um, they had these at every station. And it's the, the uh, slogan is go this way. And it has a pointing hand. And it's very clever. Philadelphia is the sleeve. City Hall is the cufflink. The red is the P&W lines to Stratford and to Norristown. And it shows all the station stops. All the other black lines are trolley lines. This doesn't even show all the railroad lines, like the Paoli line, for example, or the Chestnut Hill line. These are all just trolley lines showing the connections. The red arrow ones are down at the bottom to Westchester, Ardmore, Media. And at this point, it says Collingdale because it wasn't built all the way to uh, Sharon Hill yet. Uh, there's a line going out to Reading on the left-hand side, about halfway up. Allentown, Easton, Water Gap, Stroudsburg. These were all connections that were possible back then with just electric trolleys. In fact, you could, the Brill Company in Philadelphia would deliver trolleys from Trenton up to Trenton or all the way out to uh, Carlisle simply by running them out on their own power along each successive town's trolley line. They'd take the Red Arrow, then the Westchester Street Railway, then the Lancaster County Traction Company, and then maybe Hershey Railways or Harrisburg Railways, and, and work their way through the system uh, with um, special uh, uh, local uh, pilots on board to explain to the employee uh, the various facets of running across that particular line, how fast to go, where to slow down, which switch to take, that sort of thing. Uh, there was quite a network across this part of the state. These are the stations in Hapford Township on the PNW, and you'll recognize these names. There were two stations, Haverford College and Haverford. They were a block apart, Buck Lane and College Avenue. Uh, I guess they couldn't reach a compromise and finally it made sense to reach a compromise and they built one halfway down the block instead um, to serve both College Avenue and the college and the Buck Lane area, which was one of the first developments that uh, took place of housing in Haverford Township because it was near to Lancaster Avenue near the Pennsylvania Railroad main line. And now it was on, gonna be on the PNW as well. This is the big Beechwood Park station. They built an amusement park here that was common for trolley lines in the 19, about 1906 to 1912 to build an amusement park. They had two reasons for doing that. One, they could get people to pay a fare to go out to the amusement park. And two, they could make money on the amusement park itself and they already were generating their own electricity so they could run all the electric motors and all the lights required by an amusement park uh, with no extra real work. This is taken from the large footbridge that people could get up onto and over to the park to the right. On the left in the background, I'm sorry, in the background, you see a small elevated walkway that goes off the other end of the station and climbs up over an overpass and goes to the development of Brookline. And that's if you wanted to come and buy a property in Brookline and build a house, so you would get off here and walk up there. Or you could take the uh, Ardmore line and get off the Brookline Boulevard and uh, see the sales agent there. But this is the uh, Beechwood Park Station, about 1907. This shows the Haverford College Station at the bottom in the Red Oval, the Haverford Station 
at the top and the middle oval shows where they moved the station to and where it remains today. This is the Haverford station, the original one. And it's an odd picture from Ron DeGraw's book. It shows a construction steam locomotive coming down instead of an electric car. The line was not built yet, the uh, uh, not completed. The third rails were not electrified and they used the steam engine and some freight cars to move materials back and forth and put the ballast down and spread out the ties and the rails and do all the work of construction. And this is during the final stages of construction. But this would be, uh, this would be Buck Lane going over the bridge. This is a postcard view showing the cars on the PNW. These are the original interurban cars with the headlights up on the roof. This is looking down from Ardmore Junction, uh, Hathaway Lane, basically down towards uh, um, Eagle Road and off on the left behind the trees, paralleling the tracks is uh, Haverford, uh, Haverford Road. So this is when the line was new. Here's a later picture showing, uh, showing a 1930s car on the right. Uh, I'm sorry, 1920s and the 1930s bullet car, the cars for which the line was famous, streamlined bullet car on the left. The view is very much the same today, except the cars are stainless steel and more modern. This is a two car train at Wynwood Road Station. There are three tracks here, like there were at Beechwood Park and like there are at Bryn Mawr, so that they could turn a train, they could run a, a local train out to Wynwood Road and then pull it into the middle track, get it out of the way, have an express go by to serve people farther up the line. And then it would leave by the other track and go back to 69th Street. This is Ardmore Junction in 1955. The original station was kind of on the top of the overpasses. That's West Hathaway Lane going underneath on the left. And on the right, the uh, trolley line goes underneath the Ardmore trolley. And you can see its little station shelter under the right-hand overpass. And that's a bullet car coming down from Norristown. Again, it's pretty wide open around here. That lot to the left is where the uh, current station and parking area is in the beginning of Merwood. Here's a view from up on the track showing another bullet car and the Ardmore Junction sign. This is behind the car is where the uh, 7-Eleven is now on Haverford Road. On the very left edge of the photo, you can see Chestnut Walled School sticking up, the old Chestnut Walled School. And here's a publicity shot uh, showing the modern Liberty Liner, one of the last cars bought, the uh, four car unit uh, going across on the PNW while another car on the Red Arrow Troudmore line passes underneath. This also shows you the newer station built off to the left on the PNW. Let's talk about now what happened when things started to fall downhill. This was at the zenith where we are now of railway operations. Uh, in 1871, the original Philadelphia and Columbia Rail roadbed was abandoned when the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, straightened the line. In 1954, the PNW was taken over by the Philadelphia Suburban Transportation Company, which was a successor to the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company. Uh, they changed names when they realized they had trolley lines to other places than just Westchester. And they also owned a growing number of bus routes. And they had a number of other operations. So they generalized their name to transportation and went under the slogan of Red Arrow Lines uh, as had the uh, Philadelphia and Westchester from about 1936 on. In 1954, the Westchester trolley line was cut back to Westgate Hills. In 1956, the Strafford branch of the PNW was abandoned. Uh, part of it's now the Radnor Trail. In 1958, the Westgate Hills trolley service was abandoned. So two years after, four years after they cut the line back from Westchester to Westgate, they got rid of the whole thing. And at that point, the only trolley service on Westchester Pike was the Ardmore line from 69th Street and then heading up Darby Road. In 1963, the Newtown Square branch was cut back to Oakmont because of those trestles I showed you. In 1966, the Ardmore trolley service ended. Uh, part of it ran across private right of way so that they, when they took out the rails, they paved it and it became the first private busway in the United States and maybe the world. Um, was ahead of its time. Now we have things like bus rapid transit, 
which run just like a rail line with stations and routes and separate right away, uh, except it doesn't have rails. And this was a predecessor to them. It's actually a, a very historic thing that we still have in the township was the Red Arrow Busway. In 1970, SEPTA bought out the Red Arrow Lines. Uh, they hired a bunch of uh, college kids to augment their construction and track gangs that summer. I was part of that because they wanted to show an immediate improvement effect to convince the public that it was a good thing that SEPTA bought out the Red Arrow Lines. Uh, public agency taking over from a, a failing private company. In 1971, uh, with no service out to Haverford Township at all, and the line on Westchester Pike only going to Lanark because of the car barn being there. They closed that car barn. The Red Arrow management still owned it and sold it off to become a shopping area, a clover and then a, a, a Coles. And in 1981, the last Newtown Square Branch train ran to Oakmont. So what's left? Only the Norristown High Speed Line at this point. Now we'll talk about the freight corridor that never happened. Uh, this was part of an improvement program series in 1905 of the Pennsylvania Railroad. It turns out that four track Broadway to the West was not big enough. It was becoming clogged with freight and passenger trains and they were having trouble moving everything uh, quickly enough to satisfy all the customer demands. So they proposed building a relief line in two parts. The Western part went from the Susquehanna River to Parksburg where it joined the main line. And then a little east of that at Thorndale, an Eastern line would take off from the main line and run to the 56th Street in Philadelphia, rejoining uh, the, the, the rest of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Not only were they gonna build an entire second line, but they were going to up the uh, main line from four tracks to six between Philadelphia and Paoli, hard to imagine. It never happened. The Western portion was largely built, but the Eastern portion and the six tracking never happened because when they electrified the trains instead of using steam engines, that largely solved the congestion problem. At that point, the uh, uh, station in Philadelphia was a stub end station. Steam engines would pull in. They'd have to uncouple the train from the steam engine and pull it out with another engine to go the other way or the engine would have to back out and they'd have to do a bunch of turning around to uh, be able to go the other way. With electric trains, they were able to simply walk to the other end and run it from the other end and solved all of that problem without the uh, time delays and the extra train movements. However, what happened in Haverford was and elsewhere, Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Railroad's real estate arm called Manor Real Estate Company had already bought three quarters of the land needed for this extension of the Eastern line. And that greatly affected development patterns in Haverford and elsewhere because the railroad was simply sitting on this land. And I'll show you some of that. I've uh, highlighted the area in red stripes along the edges. And at the bottom is Township Line and down the right is Arlington Road. So you come down the hill from Manoa Road to Township Line. Uh, Lanark, as it says, is on the left here. The, the bottom right is what we now call, it's the load track, we now call it Chatham Village. Um, and what's now Chatham Park is the Pennsylvania Railroad Golf Course. The railroad bought that entire parcel of land only to get the corridor in red that I show here. And you'll see at the bottom, there's a little triangular piece of land on the other side of Erlington Road that was part of that. Uh, by the way, in the bottom left, you can see the car barn and the tracks of the trolley line uh, where Coles is now. This is a view, aerial photo looking south, so you have to think about it upside down. You can see my red lines coming down from the up from the bottom to Ur Township Line Road and crossing Erlington Road. And in the distance is the uh, golf course over in Upper Darby. There's that triangular piece of land. And if you go by there today, it used to be a golf uh, gas station. Now it's an office building with, I think, a dental office and uh, a bank. Uh, and if you wonder why it's at an angle, it's because the piece of land was angled at the back so that this line could run on it. 
and by the way, if I can go back, yes, I can. Uh, the line would have come across the golf course down the hill. It would have then gotten on a trestle to stay level. Part of it was called the Darby Creek low grade line. And low grade means they wanted minimum uh, elevation change. They wanted it to be as level as possible so that the freight trains could be pulled by steam engines efficiently. So as the ground went down, the line would have stayed up on trestles, would have crossed the intersection on trestles, crossed Arlington Road on trestles, and then gone up through uh, behind Lanark. And the, the road, as you go from bottom right to upper left, the ground would rise to meet the line. The line would then, as it went towards the upper left, be into a cut that would be under Manoa Road up at the top in a cut, would be under the trolley line, under Darby Road, and come out on the other side of Darby Road. So all of these uh, housewives in Lanark along that would have had steam engines chugging back and forth and boxcars banging around while they had their laundry out to dry in the backyard. Not what they wanted. This is a continuation north and it shows the line passing under where it would have passed under the trolley line and Darby Road and Manoa Road. And then it goes right through where the stadium is today, down in this area. Um, and then it goes through undeveloped tracks and continues on across, this is um, Eagle Road, Eagle and Lawrence, right at the top left of the map. Down here, and if you can see where I'm widely wiggling to the left bottom, uh, were some undeveloped land. It was the baby's hospital on the left and then the new gas company, which was a synthetic gas manufacturer that simply had a small storage tank out there. Um, this got developed into roads and it caused a very interesting situation as you'll see. You can see it here. This is that land in this quadrant. And this is veterans field to the right and the roof of the stadium on the right-hand side, halfway up. Washington Avenue was built and also the road next to it, Rockwood Drive, that was where Baby's Hospital was. They ended in cul-de-sacs, as you can see. And when the Pennsylvania Railroad finally sold the land, they extended Washington Avenue. And it's the only road I know of that has two cul-de-sacs at one end. They go from one cul-de-sac to an extension cul-de-sac and then you see on here, there's another cul-de-sac going off the other way. That is Harrington Road. Here's that cul-de-sac. And Harrington Road is the only road I know of that has a cul-de-sac at each end. They were able to connect the developments on both sides of this land to each other with cross streets. But if had the railroad gone through here, Harrington Road would not be there today. And these people along the edges of the red lines would have had steam engines uh, blowing cinders and smoke all over their laundry out in the backyard. Up in the upper left, you can see the old Linwood School. Linwood School have not have been there either because the line went right through Linwood School. This is again, down at the bottom is uh, Eagle Road and Lawrence Road. These are the row houses across from Linwood School, the old Linwood School. Uh, here's where the line went. Uh, at this point, Lawrence Road has been curved since then into a more gradual curve, but it would have gone under this or over this line. I don't know what the elevation would have been. And then this line would have gradually uh, come close to the existing Newtown Square branch here. And this is the trestle of that line over Ellis Road. And then the line proceeded north uh, into uh, uh, Marple and Radnor Townships. But it just shows how this how different this area could have been had they actually built that line. And that's the end. Thank you very much. Okay. Wow. <laughs> um, so um, questions for Rich? You can just unmute yourself or um, put it in the chat. I've been, um, I don't think we had any I have questions. a question, Rich. Go for it. Uh, you ready for my question? Sure thing, Chris. Um, 
Railroad Avenue, is it correct that the uh, Lincoln's funeral train came down that rail line? Do you have, we have any proof of that or? Yes, there actually is proof. Uh, we know that the uh, his inaugural train came one way down that line, going from Harrisburg to Washington. And his funeral trains a couple of years later went out that line on its way back with a lot of stops and a lot of ceremonies all the way back to Springfield, Illinois. We have reports of the um, Haverford College students and staff standing along the line, uh, solemnly watching as it processed by. And a few years before, students had stood along the line to wave at Lincoln as he went the other way off the back platform of his private car. Amazing. Yeah, there were pretty, there were pretty, there were pretty unglamorous accounts of that little station shed that they had uh, for Haverford College. It was basically described as a bunker. <laughs> hey, Rich, did that, that mean that that train went down the uh, Belmont Plain? Uh, Ed, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. Well, that was the right of way when it curved all around through Lower Maryland. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the sequencing of when the various improvements were made uh, by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Yeah, don't know. I, I've always been curious about that. You filled in some interesting blanks and in, some of the areas that I was looking at about the Columbia and uh, Pennsylvania or Pennsylvania. Yeah, Columbia. I should talk a minute about that. The line uh, east of Ardmore on the Pennsylvania Railroad main line of the uh, Philadelphia and Columbia was a little more roundabout. It, it, it basically varied, just kept curving left and right to avoid any changes of grade to keep construction costs very low. But when they came out of Philadelphia, and back then coming out of Philadelphia means crossing the Schuylkill, uh, you know, Penn Station and all of West Philadelphia was not there. Uh, they had to come up the Belmont Plain up a steep hill. And so they had an incline and they would attach the wagons and carriages to a big rope and that they had two tracks and the two would count, kind of counterweight each other. And as one car went up, the other car would come down on these ropes with a pulley at the top that they could power. And uh, there, as well as at the parts west of uh, the Susquehanna, where they had inclines and portage railroads, the uh, legislature insisted on using uh, rope and not wire cable when wire cable became available. And it turned out Pennsylvania had a, uh, a financial stake in the rope business, particularly farmers growing hemp for rope. And politically, it was uh, unsuitable for them to suggest the uh, wire. But as ropes kept breaking and people kept crashing downhill, there were reports that people would not ride the passenger cars up the hills to the Belmont Plateau, that they would walk up and wait for the car to get there and then get on because they didn't want to be crashing downhill when the rope broke. So uh, it's an interesting story in the politics. Uh, Kate had a question, uh, Rich. She said, who came up with the names for the stations? Named after existing locations or locations named after stage stations? Or both? Uh, generally, they'd be named after locations. The Westchester Pike one was called that on the Westchester line or the, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Newtown Square branch because Lanark wasn't really a name in use then. That came a little bit later. And I think the Westchester trolley line uh, was part of the reason Lanark developed. And then the when the Ardmore line came in, he started to get the places north of Lanark like Brookline and Oakmont, which was, uh, or Brookline and then South Ardmore and then what became Oakmont um, and then beyond. Um, there were accounts of uh, Peggy Getz de Sascio, who was in my class at high school and comes from the Getz family, which had farms along Westchester Pike in Manoa and Lanark, said the two of the stations back then were called Upper Getz and Lower Getz after their farms. Um, so the station names changed over time uh, Commissioner McGarity, who was, by the way, his career was being a uh, motorman on the PMW, uh, the Norristown High Speed Line. He told me that he suddenly realized that there were three stations that could have been called Oakmont, but they weren't because, or Eagle Road, they could have just called them Eagle Road, because it turns out on three different lines, there were three stations. The one called Windwood Road on the PMW actually goes under Eagle Road. Windward Road's on the other side of Haverford Road, but they didn't name it Eagle Road. And then the one in Oakmont 
on the Ardmore line wasn't called Eagle Road, it was called Oakmont. And on the Newtown Square branch, it was called Grassland, rather than calling it Eagle Road, which is what it crossed. And Eagle Road's an old name because it went to the Eagle Hotel uh, where Eagle Road crosses Westchester Pike. So there were three different places that could have been called Eagle Road, but none of them were. I'm just looking at the chat here. Uh, Gary says there is a plaque about the Belmont Plain at the Balakinwood Station. You know anything about that? Uh, no, I don't. I do know at the Kinwood Station, um, the Lower Marion Historical Society has gathered some of those stone sleepers and put together a little uh, length of rail bed uh, in the park there. Uh, to show people what those sleepers would have been like in situ in the ground. Uh, there are were, there were sleepers all over the place. We have two of them at Niter Hall that we believe came from Haverford Township from Railroad Avenue because they were given to, we, had, we know the Providence, they were given to um, Horatio Gates Lloyd, the wealthy financier who lived in Haverford, uh, by the head of the sewer department of Haverford Township. So my guess is they were doing a sewer job on Railroad Avenue and were digging and hit those big rocks, those granite blocks and had to pull a couple of them out and uh, gave them to him. And when the historical society was formed, he turned them over to the historical society. There's a man who came by this summer, uh, last summer uh, from New Jersey. He's with, he used to be with the New Jersey State Archives and he is researching all of the American primitive early railways that used stone sleepers. One of the more famous ones was in New Jersey, the Camden and Amboy, which was the predecessor to the Pennsylvania Railroad in that area. And he has found and documented hundreds of stone sleepers uh, around the country. Every one of them is geocoded. So I told him about all the stone sleepers I knew of, and he already knew about every single one of them and told me about more. Um, but it's quite interesting. If you've heard of the, uh, the uh, memorial out along the Pennsylvania rail, li rail line, the Harrisburg line and Duffy's Cut to the Irish track workers that died out there. If you look at those stone blocks, a lot of them are rectangular and have two holes in them and they're recycled uh, Philadelphia and Columbia sleepers. There were some in, uh, I've, one, he sent me a picture of one house in Villanova that has one on each side of its driveway entrance just a decorative piece in the mulch, but there are the two holes. It's a Philadelphia and Columbia uh, sleeper. Um, my parents lived in Simpson House for a while at Belmont and Monument Avenues. And uh, the one side of Simpson House is along part of Fairmount Park where there were ball fields and you could park there along the road on the side in the gravel. I got out of my car one day and stepped down and my feet were on a stone sleeper. And darn if you couldn't see two rows of them as where the rails were, heading through this gravel parking area in the Belmont area. So it's, it's amazing. People in Lower Marion, when houses were built, they'd go out to build their garden and, and immediately when they started digging, a lot of them would hit stone sleepers and say, what the heck is this in my garden? And uh, you find them all over Lower Marion. There are some in front of the, uh, along the driveway of the, I believe of the uh, uh, meeting house in Marion, but they are around. Rich, there's also some at the Paoli Battlefield. Okay. Um, there's a little, I don't know if you'd call it a stand or it's an enclosed area, but I think they took some from the cut or the main line and brought them up there. And I, I think there's at least a dozen of them up there. I wouldn't doubt if you dug up Railroad Avenue, you'd find four rows of stone sleepers along most of it underneath the road. I see there's something here about the uh, Lanark Crossing. Somebody's know at the Battle of Lanark Crossing. Uh, I pointed out the difference between Lanark Junction where the trolley line split and Lanark Crossing where the railroad and the trolley crossed. There was a race to get there and the railroad for the Newtown Square Branch got there first. Uh, but when they got there, Mr. Scheimer had cleverly put down about 150 feet of trolley track right across where they planned to cross Westchester Turnpike. And he wanted to claim first rights because he knew if the Pennsylvania Railroad put their track across that they would never let him get permission to go across their track and put in 
uh, crossing the track, um, that they would claim it was a safety issue. So he and uh, his trolley line, as the trolley line battled with the Pennsylvania Railroad, not only in court for over a year, but physically battled where he'd go out to do something and the railroad would have a steam engine sitting on the line there so that he couldn't do any work. Uh, they'd have it there with a couple uh, heavy guys from the railroad just hanging around, making sure nothing happened. And if you read Ron DeGraw's books on the Red Arrow, which are great resources, and I should talk about the resources available. Um, so I think uh, Scheimer ended up having at least 12 railroad workers arrested over time by the constables. And that probably would have been the Haverford Township constable. Um, so they went back and forth in court and physically. Um, he'd used the steam dummies to get around some of the legalities. And because the trolley wasn't ready yet, and because he didn't, wasn't sure he had the legal authority to put up trolley wires, because the original franchise for the Turnpike's uh, rail line was that it be powered by horse or steam or some other conveyance, but didn't mention electricity because that wasn't around then. Um, eventually he did win out and they put in the crossing frogs so that his line could cross the Pennsylvania Railroad. And as Ron DeGraw points out, the irony of it is the, his trolley line with the powerhouse, the coal-fired powerhouse at Lanark was the Newtown Square Branch's biggest customer. So even though they fought, he was their biggest customer in the, in the final analysis. And he outlasted them in terms of passenger service. So that's, a, that's very famous, the battles. DeGraw details them all in his book. And we now have the park at the corner of Darby Road and Westchester Pike, the urban little park on the pointy corner with the mural that uh, celebrates the Battle of Lanark Crossing. Lanark, uh, the crossing now is basically in front of the Burger King. Uh, Rich, there's a question here from Mark. He says, the station stops along Hathaway bus uh, way are still a nice reminder of the history. These seem to be passenger oriented. What were the freight destinations, industries, and sightings? Oh, along the, uh, well, along the Newtown Square branch, um, there were a number of freight industries. Uh, I'll talk about resources now because I mentioned the three DeGraw books. One is called The Red Arrow. That was his first book. It's a big coffee table book with big, beautiful photos. He then put out another book on The Red Arrow with more information uh, with a slightly different name. And then he put out one called The Pig and Whistle about the P&W, the Philadelphia and Western. A nickname for the uh, P&W among people was the Pig and Whistle. And Penfield had piggeries, so that may have something to do with it uh, back in the day. Um, but the other resource that we have, there's no good resource really for the Philadelphia and Columbia early steam line, but the Newtown Square Branch and the Darby Creek low grade line are both covered in very excellent publications of the High Line which was a periodical put out by the Philadelphia chapter of the uh, National uh, Pennsylvania Railroad Technical and Historical Society. I'm sorry, it's the Pennsylvania Railroad Technical and Historical Society. The Philadelphia chapter put out a quarterly or semi-annual publication called the High Line. There's a two-part article in the High Line back from I think the 70s or 80s um, on the uh, Newtown Square branch and there's a later article on the O-grade line, which goes into all the details of the real estate and the plans and why it didn't happen. Uh, those are excellent. But one of the things they do in the High Line articles on the Newtown Square Branch is they have the information from the railroad. I think there were index cards that showed when every switch was put in and every customer. And they give a chronology of all the customers. Uh, basically, as the township became residential and farm fields were cut up into subdivisions and housing lots were sold. Uh, there was a big need for two things. One was lumber yards and building supply yards. And the second was coal yards because all the houses were heated with a coal furnace. And there's, there were three different coal yards right in Lanark alone and additional ones up the line. Um, but there was a big one at the end of Harvard that was a, uh, it started out as a, um, a road building company. They had road building supplies there 
and where the new houses are on the extension of Harvard Ave Road. Um, there was an elevated siding way up in the air, up on concrete piers that had drop places and they could drop gravel and stone and asphalt supplies into bins and areas where they could store them for building roads. When that stopped being a building road building place, it became a, a coal oil, coal and oil place, McCandless, and eventually became a fuel oil supplier only. That's how it ended. So you had a lot of those. There was also, excuse me. There was also a uh, uh, junkyard, a scrapyard along the line as you got towards Eagle Road going north. Uh, Bruno and Bruno Brothers, I think it was called. There was another name when it had a partner. And, uh, and then across Eagle Road, there were a number of things. There was a soapstone company that if you have an old sink in your basement in Brookline or some old building, it's probably soapstone. It's that slippery gray flat uh, material made into an, a utility sink. And they actually had a soapstone factory in uh, Oakmont. Um, there was also a, a place called Artcrete, which made concrete statuary and bird fountains and things for lawns. Um, and the worst of them all was the uh, wood, National Wood Preservers, which uh, used chemicals to uh, treat and preserve lumber to make treated foam poles and railroad ties and other things. Uh, they dumped all those chemicals right on the ground or down a well. And now we have the Superfund site, uh, thanks to National Wood Preservers. But it was mostly lumber and coal yards to serve suburban growth. Uh, the last one that was put in, the last industry, was the Philadelphia Gum Factory, Philadelphia Chewing Gum Corporation. And that didn't come in until after World War II. And that was the uh, last, fact, the last uh, um, one of the last uh, businesses on the line when they uh, closed the line down. By that point, they were shipping by truck, but they were getting a lot of their raw materials in uh, by rail, by freight car. So we did have briefly a, a, a commercial corridor along the Newtown Square branch line. Uh, Rich, there's a question from uh, Tony uh, who lives in Harford Hall. He says um, he's built up against what used to be called Haverford Mountain. Uh, Eckhart's history of the mills indicates that the top of Haverford Mountain was a boulder that could be rotated without uh, falling. The top of the mountain is gone. The area that's been leveled uh, it was first a synagogue and now a Chinese church. Did the PNW flatten the mountain just as they cut through it for the? Excuse me, uh, for the. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not some. I know. I know. Kids like to call it Haverford Mountain back in the day. It wasn't so much of a mountain, and there was Star Rock, uh, another kid name back then. Um, it's, it's 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 a place where there's a dramatic drop in the elevation of the uh, land down towards Cobbs Creek. I mean, Oakmont is higher than Haverford Mountain. Uh, they did cut the line right through the edge of that um, in, uh, slope when they built the PNW through Beechwood and along what's now Karakung Drive. I don't think they did anything about that rock, the boulder. I think that may have just fallen on its own or perhaps was helped by people, but I don't think the PNW did anything with that. Another question here. Um, let's see. Um, do you have any information on the legal counsel for the Columbia Philadelphia Railroad? Uh, uh, Libby says her family lore has it that my grandfather was their attorney and my GM and my grandmother came from Columbia PA, but the dates you indicate for the ending of that line doesn't work with their dates. Okay. Well, the uh, end of the line would have been when, I guess, the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad took it over. And what did I say that was? 1850-something? 1850s? Um, you'd have to look back. Um, so I don't know if that fits in or not. He may have been an attorney. I, I wouldn't doubt it. He may have been uh, kept on by the Pennsylvania Railroad as part of, you know, they were growing by leaps and bounds. The Pennsylvania Railroad was, as I said, over 300 corporations. 
It was the largest employer in the United States and supposedly the world. And it had a bigger budget than the federal government. To put it into context, it was called the standard railroad of the world, not just because it was big, but because they actually did a whole lot of detailed testing and they had standards that specified every detail of everything, including the brooms that conductors used to sweep snow off the steps in the winter. Everything was researched and done in a lab and they set standards that had to be met by all their suppliers. So it was a huge organization. A lot of their top brass, by the way, lived along the main line, along the Paoli line. And a lot of the mansions out that way were the original homes of the wealthy top people of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The one most remembered is A.J. Cassatt. And you may know of his sister, Mary Cassatt, who was in the Paris uh, band of Americans uh, in, involved in the arts back in that day. A.J. Cassatt was the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. He also served as the president of the uh, Lancaster Turnpike Company uh, during that period, mainly because the Pennsylvania Railroad didn't want any trolley lines along Lancaster Road as competition, so they could control the Turnpike Company. When somebody asked for rights to put a trolley line, they could say no. <laughs> That's why there are no trolley lines uh, on Lancaster Road ever. Um, and A.J. Cassatt, when he retired, also was very involved in perversely getting good roads in Lower Marion Township. And if you go up to the end of Haverford Station Road to Montgomery uh, Road and go to the left and then go down Grays Lane, you'll see on the corner there a monument to A.J. Cassatt for his work uh, bringing good roads to Lower Marion Township and to the region. Other questions for Rich? I have a question. Rich, I was curious when you mentioned that it was uh, possible even today to run a private carriage train on the lines. Yeah, you can, you can have your own freight cars. Uh, there was a great, uh, apparently a tax dodge for doctors and lawyers in the 70s and 80s to, to at least to own a boxcar and to have them out there for rental. Uh, the railroad would they'd simply go into the pool of boxcars and uh, people might get a boxcar. There was a company called Railbox that owned uh, a lot of boxcars. Uh, that if you ever see, there's a train now that's all painted up for Tropicana orange juice, refrigerated cars coming up from Florida. That is owned by, all those cars are owned by Tropicana itself. Uh, if you look at the marks on the side of a, a freight car today, they have some letters and then a number, an ID number. And if the letters end in an X, like T R O X, that means that means a private car, and it is a private freight car. So the idea was that you would own your own car, but you didn't have to provide the power for it. Yes, the, the power that's, was coming from whatever. That's right, and there were rail fans today that own passenger cars, and they can have them pulled behind an Amtrak train, but they have to meet all the Amtrak standards for electric power to be able to plug into an Amtrak train. They have to pay every mile their travel. They have to pay for the yard space they take up when they're in the 30th street coach yard overnight. They have to pay to get hooked into the wayside power so they have lighting. It's an expensive hobby, but there are people and organizations that own private railroad cars and you'll see them put on the ends of trains sometime or there'll be an entire charter train uh, on a railroad for rail fans. Thank you. For Rich? I see a question about coal yards for synthetic gas. Oh, yeah. Uh, the new gas company, from what the maps, the Atlas maps that we have, they bought the land. They never seemed to do much with it. I did find an article, thanks to Google uh, digitizing all these strange uh, professional journals from the early days, about the new gas company. And um, they were trying to make gas out of coal. That was, they did not use oil and refine it to gas. They were making gas another way and trying to make that commercially affordable and viable. It never really happened. But uh, one of the things tied into synthetic gas is that was Germany's downfall in World War II. Germany did not have oil uh, and oil wells and they had to, uh, to supply all their fuel for the Wehrmacht and for their air force 
they had to use synthetic gas and make synthetic gas, which was not easy and, and not cheap. And they, they ran short in the end. So it's an interesting chapter in the township history where a synthetic gas company did set up a place out here in Haverford, but never really made much use of it. Where the Scadium is and the uh, uh, township building, that, that whole corner was owned by Atlantic Richfield, which was later Arco, a gas company. And they had some storage tanks there. And I guess had plans for future growth, but it became the township's uh, site for the uh, township building and for Veterans Field. So hey, I'm Ruth. always, oh, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned about coal gas. Um, you would probably know the name Thaddeus Lowe, like the Mount Lowe uh, Electric Railway in California. He was from Norristown, and I believe his, his the, as I understand the history, he made his money from uh, making coal gas. And he took all of his money and he went to Pasadena and built a big house there and then built the uh, incline railway up the mountain and the narrow gauge electric line all across the whole top of the mountain there north of uh, Los Angeles and I probably some other venture out there. But I do remember that there, I, but I don't know where his coal gas plant was. It may have been in Norristown. Uh, it may have been somewhere else in the area. Yeah, I don't know. The new gas company, they had their major facility down in Philadelphia. I did find a couple page article about them and an old, like I said, a Google uh, a scan thing called Petroleum Age Magazine or something like that from the, uh, from the 20s or 30s. And that's the only information I have on them. I had a question just about um, kind of the the demise of all of the trolleys. I mean, I'd always heard that, you know, it was car companies that, that bought them all up and ripped up the tracks. Is that, uh, is that true? If, if you talk to people like Ed Scuchis and I, who are members of the East Penn Traction Club and trolley nuts, uh, you'll get a, a, a lot of uh, arguments about that. It was, there was a company um, called National City Lines. Correct me if I go off, beat, uh, off base, Ed. But National City Lines was a combination of General Motors, Standard Oil of Ohio, and I believe the Firestone Tire Company. And one of their missions was to convert all the trolley systems in the country to buses that GM could build and Firestone could put the tires on and Standard Oil of Ohio, Ohio uh, could uh, fuel with diesel fuel or gas fuel. And uh, that went on and it was called the uh, bustitution of trolley lines. Um, and people made a clamor about it. And a guy who's a well-known rail fan out of New England uh, E.J. Quinby and others actually did file a suit, I think in the 40s. And there was a big congressional hearing and uh, National City Lines and these three companies were found guilty and fined a dollar for something like that. The feeling was that it would have happened inevitably, but they simply accelerated the process. But they're so still they got rid of the whole whole Pacific Electric system in uh, Los Angeles, and where are all the new rapid transit lines going in? Back generally where the Pacific Electric was. Yes, so I had a, them. I had a thirty year career with New Jersey Transit, and the guys in charge of bus service planning used to tell me if you uh, dug up any road with the bus route on it, you'd find the rails underneath the asphalt from the trolleys. Yep. They didn't change the routes. Sometimes the, the bus routes, they said, well, why does the bus go over there? Well, that's where the original franchise trolley line went. Really, it needed to be two blocks over. So they had to go and, you know, uh, rearrange all the, the legalities to where they had to have their bus line. So that's the story behind that. There's an element of truth to it. Uh, it's still debated even among trolley fans, whether it really made a difference or not. Last questions for Rich. I, I think we could talk pretty much all night, but it's because it's fascinating. Um, but I want to make sure any, anybody's got a burning question to to ask Rich about about railroads and 
Haverford Township. Anything? Well, thank you so much, Rich. Uh, we will, uh, like I said, I've been recording. I will send the, um, I will send the the uh, link to uh, the YouTube uh, recording uh, to the YouTube channel and the recording tonight, so you can watch it and share it with others. Um, and just thank you so much. And um, the library is really grateful to the Historical Society for our for our partnership. Sure thing. I uh, I thought this might go longer than it did with all the slides I had, so I did rush through it. Uh, like I said, if somebody wants to watch it in more detail and take notes or study things more, they can watch uh, YouTube and put it on pause. Uh, yep. Because I think it may be the only really detailed account of all the railways in this township that gets done for some time. I like having it on my computer so I could actually look at the uh, the maps a little closer. <laughs> I, could, I could get really close to them. So um, one of the a, one of the nice beautiful things. One of the beautiful things we have at the Historical Society is we have the collection of glass plate uh, negatives and photos of a man called Wilbur Hall. And Wilbur Hall started out as an oiler on the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company in the powerhouse where they generated power in Lanark and worked his way up to being basically chief engineer of the trolley lines. And he had a hobby of uh, you know, photography back in the day of glass plate negatives and big cameras. And we're very lucky uh, his wife was uh, at one point on the board of the Historical Society mm -hmm. and a lot of Wilbur Hall's uh, negatives and, and prints came to us and they document a lot of the trolley lines, particularly the, uh, the, the steam plant and the generating equipment, all that machinery uh, is very well documented and uh, we're really lucky to have his views as well as his uh, personal photos of like, you know, picnics at his home in Lanner on Tenby Road and things like that. The um, uh, I have friends named Nestler, and the Nestler house uh, at uh, 25 uh, Park Road in Lanark was the home of uh, uh, A.A. A. Uh, Aiken, uh, who was the vice president of the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company and helped to form the Lanark uh, Fire Company. And Mr. Aiken was a became a prominent figure through his work on the Philadelphia and Westchester Traction Company. And his home was built at 25 Park Avenue. And as I mentioned about the communications as well as the transportation, his phone number was two. You didn't have to dial back then. You called up the operator, Millie or somebody, and you didn't have to have four digits. You could just say, get me liner two. And she put the cable into the, into the plug and away you went. Wow, probably the second one in Lanark to have a phone. <laughs> the second one in the whole exchange out here to have wow. a phone. Wow. All right, well, um, and Kate said just our, the theme for the Heritage Festival is railways. So come on out and learn more. Um, again, tell us the date one more time for Heritage Day. It's Sunday, June, June 5th. June 5th. Sunday, June 5th, from 11 to 4. <laughs> In beautiful before. Powder Mill Valley along uh, Karakung Drive. Right near the Beachwood train station. There you go. <laughs>